Daybreak in a forest in central India. This is Bandhavgarh, a national park in Madhya Pradesh. Here, Maharajas once killed tigers for sport. Today, the tiger rules. This is Sita, queen of the forest, hunter, mate, and mother. Like all tigers, Sita hunts alone, by stealth. Sambar are her favorite prey. Sita relies on an element of surprise. She's a sprinter, not a distance runner, and needs to get close enough to mount an ambush. Others depend on Sita's success. Her son and her two daughters are still with her. At two years old, they're adolescents, and they sometimes squabble. <laughs> By this age, most tiger cubs have left home to hunt for themselves, but these three still wait for their food to be served. Sita tries to slip past the Sambar's early warning systems. but the alarm has been triggered. Too late this time. Perhaps you'll have better luck deeper in the jungle. In Bandhavgarh, there are plenty of second chances. Cheetal, or spotted deer, are even more abundant than the sambar. It's now February, the end of winter, and in the early morning, they gather to browse on the sal trees. Nearby, langur monkeys start their day. After a quick wash and brush up, it's playtime. Elsewhere in the park, Sita's teenagers are still waiting for their breakfast. Plump and pampered, they show no interest in finding their own. It seems their mother has spoiled them. But at 17, Sita is getting old and the hunt is getting harder. With their big ears, Samba can pick up the tiniest sound from the undergrowth. But until they can also see the danger, they don't know which way to run. Sita's patience pays off, but how long will she have the kill to herself? If Sita is queen of the forest, there is also a king. Charger, Sita's mate and the father of her cubs. 
Although he too is getting on at 14 years old, his reputation goes before him. Sita struggles to hide her hard-won meal before her freeloading family appear. Charger isn't keen on hunting either. Like the cubs, he prefers to let others do the hard work. Sita grabs a few mouthfuls of meat, but she daren't stop for a proper feed, not until she feels the kill is safe from prying eyes. but her son has overheard the chase. Sita will not have long before he tracks her down. The young male sets off after his mother. By this time, she's eaten her fill and is enjoying a well-earned rest. Sita's son greets her, but he gets a frosty reception. His mother is really tired of supporting him. As tigers and humans compete for space, the forest is shrinking. Nowadays, it's not so easy for a youngster to find a territory of his own, and he has yet to learn to hunt. Above, other hungry eyes watch and wait. Vultures. Sita settles back to continue her snooze, but there isn't a moment's peace. Next on the scene is one of her daughters. By the time the other sister appears, Sita's patience is exhausted. When the tigers are finished, other scavengers, like the jungle crows, will take their turn. But they know their place in the pecking order. Neither they nor the vultures will try to jump the queue while there's a tiger nearby. Sita's young daughter finishes eating and starts marking her territory, at least one sign that she's growing up. Once they've moved on, the crows move in. Bandavgarh stretches for 300 square miles and Jarja's territory covers around 60 of these. Like Sita, he is advancing in years and the pug marks of a stranger could spell trouble for him and his family. It's now two years since he and Sita produced their three cubs. From the start, the young male was indulged by his mother, while the sisters were more independent. Father and son also developed a special relationship, a bond of affection very rare amongst male tigers. But these cubs weren't the only ones in the park. 
Three others, all males, were born a year later to one of Charger and Sita's older daughters, Bachi. Bachi had mated with a newcomer to the area, probably the owner of the pug marks. Now Bachi's cubs are no longer babies. They're over a year old and growing fast. Though still content to stick close to their mother, they seem more spirited than Sita's cubs. This rival dynasty may one day trigger Charger's downfall. Just by setting foot on Bachi's turf, Charger is caught in conflict. And he won't have the advantage of arriving unannounced. So far, Bachi's boys are blissfully unaware of his presence, which is good. Charger has injured his eye, probably fighting Bachi's mate, and he needs a moment to assess the situation. Right now, the youngsters are only a threat to frogs. They won't deter an adult male, especially one with mating on his mind. Bachi is a possibility, and Charger decides to check her out. One of the cubs cowers in terror at Charger's approach, and Bachi completely ignores his advances. A drink is as much as he's going to get. But she won't be ready to mate again until her cubs have left her. Charger finally gets the message and wanders off. The king of the forest is in a sorry state. Hungry, battle-scarred and rejected. But Bachi and her cub can relax. Charger cleans his injured eye and gathers his strength. His best bet is to continue patrolling his territory. After all, he has at least three other females and further down the track, he may get a warmer welcome. <coughs> Wallowing in their private waterhole, Butchie's family is happy doing nothing much. Fishing for frogs is enough to keep the youngsters amused during the heat of the day. Like many young animals, this male cub mimics adult life through play. It's a way of sharpening his teeth and his skills as a predator. But for now, he and his brothers bask in the security of their mother's side. As 
As he resumes his rounds, Jarja sprays the trees with pungent scent to mark his boundaries. It's like an invisible fence or a giant poster with the words, keep out. As he re-enters Sita's domain, his male cub comes to welcome him with a quick cheek rub. This is surprising behavior, especially as the young male approaches adulthood and normally would be seen as competition by now. But today, Jarja is more interested in Sita and his daughters. He's still looking for a mate. One of his daughters sprays on a tree but at two years old, she's not yet sexually mature. Jarja realizes this from her scent. He'll have to look elsewhere. As humans encroach on the forest, so Jarja's territory has become smaller and more isolated. He may have little choice but to mate with his daughters. But inbreeding could cause problems for future generations in Bandavgarh. Jarja's other option is Sita, but she too is off limits. She can't come into heat again until her present cubs finally leave. Still without a meal or a mate, Jarja's only choice is to continue his wanderings. Sita and her family rest until the cool of nightfall. It's now April and in the early morning, steam rises from the waterhole heralding the heat of the day to come. The grasslands come to life as early birds, red-vented bulbuls, begin to stir. So does Charger. Deeper in the forest, Sita's family is still sleeping peacefully. As usual, the king's approach sends his subjects flying. Charger's well-worn trail can take him 10 to 15 miles a day, checking on his females, looking for food, and reinforcing his invisible scented boundaries. Smaller animals don't find it so easy to ward off enemies. They have to outwit them instead. Langurs take turns on lookout to watch for predators. In the jungle, death comes in many forms, including an Indian python. Pythons use the streams to get around and also to hide from unsuspecting prey. They share the tiger's taste for cheetal and langur meat, but track their prey by tasting its smell in the air rather than by sight. Inexperienced youngsters are most vulnerable. Pythons can grow to 30 feet long and kill by suffocating their victims in their giant coils. The lookout sounds the alarm, but is it too late? 
Too late for the baby langur. The python swallows its prey whole. Afterwards, it gapes to realign its jawbones. The rest of the Longo troop can now relax. The snake won't strike again today. It moves off. In fact, this meal could keep it going for a couple of weeks. But in the jungle, there's always someone else on your tail. Sita will soon be hunting again, especially with her good-for-nothing son to feed. At the start of summer, flame of the forest trees come into flower, producing delicious nectar, an unusual delicacy for crows. For once, the crows get to eat before the tigers. Langurs feast on juicy moa flowers, and others are attracted by the powerful fragrance. Cheetal graze the forest floor, nibbling fallen flowers, which are as sweet and succulent as tiny fruits. They can't reach the treetops, but fortunately, langos are messy eaters and drop plenty of leftovers. Sita's son is also hungry. He's still waiting for a handout. Although the forest is full of food, mortality is still high among baby langurs. Sita can't shake off her young male, and with him in tow, she stands little chance of creeping up on the cheetal and langurs. As usual, there's a guard on duty. No one could save the sick baby. It has fallen and died, but the tigers have been spotted and Cheetal and Langos beat a hasty exit. Soon, there's only the dead baby left. And Sita's dim-witted son seems to hope it will fall straight into his mouth. He just can't grasp the fact it's out of reach. He asks his mother what to do, but this time she can't help him. In fact, she seems to despair of him. Sita's talent as a hunter may have skipped a generation. The sisters are practicing their skills by ambushing each other. 
They've always been more independent than their brother, but even they are not yet fully self-sufficient. As Sita's family returns once more to her side, her son demonstrates his subservience. Sita is looking increasingly weary, and this display of weakness seems to be the last straw. If the youngsters won't leave her, she may have to leave them. This time, she makes it clear they are not to follow. Sita is old and weaker than she looks. Her chances of establishing another territory may be slim, but she has no choice. If she stays, she will die of exhaustion. Her son watches her go. He calls, but Sita abandons her territory and her young. It looks as if Sita's reign is over. In another part of Bandavgarh, another family is growing up. Bachi is still supporting her three males, who are just over a year. It's a full-time job, but at four years old, she has the energy to cope. One large sambar can feed four tigers for a day or so. But she needs at least 12 pounds of meat a day, but she'll always eat more if she can get it. Thieves are all around, and her cubs must learn to protect their kill. If they leave it in the open, it won't be there for long. But she shows them how to drag the carcass to a more sheltered spot to ward off scavengers. Crows and vultures have a panoramic view over the park. It doesn't take them long to pinpoint a kill. But she continues covering her catch. But the cubs are more of a hindrance than a help. This is an important lesson in survival, but the cubs are more interested in returning to their games. They're being watched. Finally, their mother drags the bulk of the kill into the undergrowth, well out of the reach of uninvited guests. A jungle crow sharpens its beak, just in case.
Hot, tired and full of food, Bachi flops down. It's the moment the crows have been waiting for. They swoop in to collect the scraps. In the sweltering heat, Bachi doesn't have the energy to stop them. More diners arrive. Now a vulture joins the picnic. As temperatures reach up to 50 degrees, Jarja slumps in a shallow pool, a favorite occupation for tigers. The hotter it gets, the more precious water becomes. There's nothing like a refreshing bath, especially when you've spent the day up to your beak in blood. Jarja isn't far away, but he's too hot to move. With Charger out of action, Langur and Jital can safely quench their thirst. Even at the height of summer, this stream never runs dry. The banks are a meeting point for forest animals. At peak times, things can get quite crowded. As evening approaches, the cheetahs start to move out of the shade to graze. By July, the land is parched. There's little nutrition left in the shriveled stems. As summer draws to a close, Sita's son still calls for his mother. But he must face the rainy season without her. The monsoon winds come all the way from the Indian Ocean, thousands of miles to the southwest. Swollen clouds gather over Bandhavgarh, ready to drop their precious moisture on the forest. The rains begin. Vultures sit out the storm. Streams and rivers are replenished. Three feet of rain can fall in just a few months. As langurs take shelter, Chital stay out in the open, refreshed and energized. It's not the best time for tigers. Hunting is difficult in the thick undergrowth. But life goes on. Rain or shine, the king of the forest continues patrolling his borders.
By late October, the clouds are beginning to clear and Bandhavgur emerges bright and lush. Jital graze the succulent pastures. All this new grass is good for them and good for those who eat them. The langurs too grow plump and healthy. But today, Charger has other things on his mind. He's picked up the scent of a prospective mate. The attraction isn't far away. But she, she's alone now, her cubs have gone, and she's back in heat. She's certainly a likely candidate for mating. But she's boys haven't gone far. They've settled in a neighboring area, but it's far enough away to make the break. They still enjoy each other's company, but sooner or later, this affection will turn to competition and they'll split to make their own way. Now 20 months old, the brothers are already much more active than Sita's lethargic trio. But while they sharpen their survival skills, it pays to stick together. For now, they're happy to work, rest and play as a team. These young tigers seem to have inherited their mother's skills. With every kill, they grow stronger and more confident. They've also remembered how to hide the meat. One of the males is more restless than the others. As his brothers enjoy a second helping, He's ready to explore. One of the things he hasn't yet learned is that tigers aren't the world's experts at climbing trees. The other two are completely absorbed in their meal. The third cub decides it's time to experiment. He got up, but can he get down? Charger isn't far away, but he's not interested in the cubs. He's homing in on his potential mate, and he won't be distracted. Not even by the chance of a meal. Nothing gets in the king's way. 
except the rule about tigers and trees. A wise Chital never takes a tiger for granted, though. Bachi's scent is getting stronger. Charger has a new spring in his step. To tantalize him further, Bachi sprays the undergrowth. Charger picks up her message and leaves a reply. Finally, the pair come face to face. Bachi is looking her most delectable. She encourages her suitor by rubbing her scent all over the ground. Charger knows better than to rush in, but when Bachi leads, he's quick to follow. Nearby, Bachi's males can hear the commotion, but are unconcerned. Mating may continue off and on for several days, but it only lasts a few seconds at a time. The male's penis is barbed to hold it in place, which means there's a limit to the female's tolerance. Charger will have to wait a while before he tries his luck again. One of the boys hears Butchie's warning growls. But it's all just a part of the courtship ritual. <laughs> Mating is over, at least for now. Both Bachi and Charger are ready for a break. In fact, Charger is completely drained. After all this excitement, they will soon go their separate ways. Bachi's boys have youth and energy on their side. 
In contrast, Jarja's powers are at an all-time low. Food is now top of his agenda. He doesn't have the strength or inclination to hunt for himself, but with a bit of luck, he'll manage to scrounge a meal off someone else. <coughs> Bachi's sons might have a carcass stashed away, but even if they do, why should they let Jarja share it? They're almost as big as he is now. He'll only get a feed if he can still pull rank. But while their backs are turned, Charger takes the easy option. He sneaks up and tries to steal their food. So far, so good, but Jarja is too tired to make a quick getaway. When the brothers return to find their food gone, they soon pick up the thief's scent. They're not about to lose their hard-earned kill. And Jarja is outnumbered, three to one. But the youngsters are cautious. Jarja has size and experience on his side. One of the young males closes in. The game of cat and mouse continues. Charger is now slowing up. A showdown can't be far away. The youngster catches up. Jarja and Sita's young male has inherited his father's lack of enthusiasm for hunting. Hunger drives him to the edge of the park, into human territory. A buffalo would be a nice soft target. But here in the open, humans rule, not tigers. Sita's son heads into an uncertain future. His sisters have inherited their mother's kingdom, deep in the heart of Bandhavgarh. Here in this ruined temple, Sita once hid her tiny cubs. Now, one of her daughters is in charge, and the other female has also made this her home, for the time being. At three years old, the sisters still get on together, but they will soon need their space. When that day comes, they'll either divide their territory or one will leave to seek a new life elsewhere.
as more and more humans intrude on the tiger's domain, their choices are limited. Elsewhere, the other cubs are also trying to make their way, but they're not ready to challenge the king. Charger managed to hold on to the meat, but he hasn't got far. Their bellies full and in the heat, the youngsters can't keep their eyes open. Charger isn't interrupted. But she too is conserving her strength. If she's pregnant again, she'll need it. Sita's title, Queen of the Forest, now belongs to Bachi. With only around 35 tigers left in Bandhavgar, 2,000 in the whole of India, every new litter is precious. Bachi, mother, daughter, mate, is the best hope for the future. Darshan Pyasi Jinsara Chitwa